All right, Tyler, let's talk about a couple of dividend stocks that look like they're facing some near-term headwinds. Whether we think those headwinds are going to pass and looking long-term where you'd be putting your money. There's always opportunities in companies that are having a little bit of an issue. And so when those opportunities arise, it's worth taking a look. I'm Jason Hall. This is Investing Unscripted. This video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. If you're looking for even more great stock ideas than the two ideas we're going to talk about right now, go to our special link. It's fool.com forward slash unscripted. Go to that link and you can get access to the 10 best stocks to buy right now. Okay, Tyler. So Hershey Hormel. Let's start with Hormel. What's going on? Yeah. So it's been a couple of years of, we'll call it weirdness at Hormel. For those who the name sounds vaguely familiar, I think their most kind of their flagship product is spam. Maybe not something that's on everybody's minds when it comes to buying food products, but it has a relatively large and diverse portfolio in We'll call it protein, basically. Ham products, the deli sliced meats, as well as a real large investment in, into the nuts and things like that. They made a large acquisition of planters, which may be a little bit of the reason why things are not going so great here, as well as holy guacamole, so giving into avocados and things like that. But basically like a, a protein prepared refrigerated food of business. If you look at it right now, it's trading for about 21 times earnings and has a dividend yield of 3.7%, which is the highest it has been in years. And part of the reason that this has been an issue is a kind of a multitude of things. Number one, inflation was a huge problem for, for Hormel, especially when it comes to supply chain woes that we really started to see in the post-COVID pandemic area. Also, at right around, not too earlier before pandemic, they had also made that large acquisition of planters, which was not, I'm not going to say that it was bad, but it was probably not the value accretive acquisition that they may have thought it was. And so it's been a little bit of a, little bit of a drag trying to get it up to snuff or what they thought it was going to be at the time of the acquisition. As far as, I think a lot of the reason that people invest in this company, of course, is the dividend which to the company's credit has been one of the more reliable sources. It's been a, a strong dividend payer for a very long time. I think the last time it's on interruption was in the early 90s. A payer, but a grower. That's right. the key. You look at the long term and it has a very long track record of generally growing that dividend right. pretty much every year. The one thing that I will note, and this is the two things that when I started to look at it, started to throw up some, some flags of caution. Number one, its dividend growth has slowed down precipitously. Uh, through the early 2000s, this was a company that was growing its dividend well over 10% a year. Uh, that has since slowed down to about three and a half. It's payout ratio has been climbing. So basically the amount of money that goes out the door for dividends has been climbing. It's about 78% right now, which is not the end of the world, but not great when it comes to relatively slow growing kind of businesses like this. Anything above 70 starts to throw a little caution to the wind. And the, the last thing that I think makes it a little bit more challenging, it, it has spent quite a bit on buybacks, which sounds great right? Like buybacks is supposed to be, you throw that as a one-two punch with a dividend and it's supposed to be one of the more value creative sort of things that it does. But as much as it's been spending on buybacks, its actual total share count has increased over the past 10 years. And it wasn't exactly just like a one-time thing for some of those acquisitions. And so you do have to wonder if you're buying back stock, why is your share count continuing to rise as it is? And if that's the case, that actually is a bad sign for your dividend because if you have to pay out for more shares all the time, that's putting an increasing burden on how much you actually have to pay out and might make it a little bit more troublesome unless the business can really start to find its footing with some of its operational cost inflation uh, problems. You hit on a couple of things with their history of acquisitions is generally they've also made acquisitions that fit, fit in really well. So of course the Hormel brand, I think everybody knows Hormel Chili also owns Stag Chili. They've made a number of acquisitions too, and like the Mexican foods, a lot of canned foods, something they have some operational expertise in, and they can find ways to get better operating leverage and drive out costs while also trying to leverage those brands. The Applegate products, the bacon and other things that they own, they have experience in processing and preparing uh, meat as well. You want to find things that companies have like some operational knowledge in when they're making these bolt-on acquisitions that they can leverage what they're really good at to improve that other business to drive per share value. Definitely questionable with the planner's acquisition, how well that fit in 
but still a very strong, profitable, cash flowing business. They've continued to grow the payout, even as the stock price has come down a lot over the past couple of years. Not a payout cut risk, I think, with Hormel. Still a solid business. But let's talk about the other one. Hershey, again, a household name, the Hershey's Chocolate, of course, all of the other brands that they own, they own snack food brands as well. So they've built a pretty nice portfolio of products. Sales are going backwards though. Revenue is down about one and a half percent. One of the things we see with these kind of businesses, Tyler, is revenue can come down and then you see earnings come down even more. Earnings per share down almost 13% on a 1.4% revenue decline. So two things are happening. Revenue comes down, you don't get as much operating leverage, but also Tyler, they're dealing with higher costs. Yeah, I I think if we all remember, was it six to nine months ago, one of the hot financial topics was how much cocoa prices had increased. There was a, call it a a run on cocoa because of some weather-related issues around the world. And obviously when it comes to Hershey, chocolate is one of its core raw materials, especially for the portfolio that it owns. Like you said, it's a diversified snack group, but it leverages pretty hard to the sweets and chocolate for its part has typically signs contracts to ease some of that price inflation, but it's not immune to it. As much as they are very stable businesses with decent margins, they're not super high margin businesses. And a few percentage points of margin changes, whether because of cost of goods or because of some operational issues where some overhead costs increase that can really impact the, the the bottom line pretty quickly as it did this past quarter with Hershey. I'm going to call out one more thing from the, the press release that breaks that down. 41.3% gross margin in the third quarter of this year was almost 45% year over year. That's higher costs of uh, goods sold. It is directly tied to that. That's what dropped, brought their profits down the most. The revenue was mostly affected by a decline in the snacks business. Besides the confectionery, again, that's all the sweet goods you talked about. But again, this is the by far the largest part of the business. So even with that large 15% decline in North American salty snacks, total revenue was only down 1.4%. So again, that gets back to everything you were talking about, Tyler. This still this is the core of the business. It's the most important part. And it's the thing where those higher costs are weighing the most on the bottom line. So that's the reality. So again, we know those near-term headlines. There have been some short reports that have been written about Hershey too. Competition's uh, something else that's been called out in some of the short reports, Tyler. Mr. Beast's chocolate brand Feastables has managed to establish itself, get some shelf space and some large retailers. Disruption's always a risk. When we're talking about the sugary, sweet sort of market, you're going up against M&M Mars. Nestle. There's some other pretty big fish in the pond here to compete against. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Okay. We've talked a little bit about the challenges the businesses are dealing with. We talked about with Hormel, the issues with the stock price coming down, the yield being pushed up. I'm just going to compare Hormel and Hershey real quick on a couple of charts, compare the performance of the dividend growth and talking about shares outstanding. So again, this is that 10 year we looked at before with Hormel. I've added Hershey. So again, Hershey continues to grow its dividend at a higher rate. Particularly more recently, we see some pretty large increases, whereas it's flattening out with Hormel's dividend growth and share repurchases. There's less Hershey shares now than there were a decade ago versus the opposite for Hormel. One more chart here, dividend yield, 2.9% yield for Hershey, substantially lower than Hormel, but based on the context of the two businesses, thinking about valuation, thinking about opportunity, where do you land on which of these stocks you like better? I think I'm going to lean towards Hershey. I think they're Hormel has a little bit of house cleaning it needs to do on both on its operation side and its balance sheet before I would be willing to take a a swing at this. Like you show, even though the, the dividend yield is higher and it's arguably the cheaper stock, I think it's cheaper for a reason. I, I'm not predicting anything like a dividend cut at this point, but I think there's a decent chance that we could see a even further slowing of the payout and potentially cash going towards some other things in the business rather than the priority of the dividend. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm going to bring this up again. It's almost never a good thing when you see a yield at essentially long-term highs for a company. That usually means there's problems. But we've seen Hershey's yield at this point in the past. This is just the highest it's been in the past six or eight years. Again, opportunity for investors, I think, I want to talk about payout ratio as well, because this is really important. You mentioned it, 78% payout ratio for uh, a foods business is really high. That's more like what you tend to see from like a utility than you're going to see from a consumer foods company like this. 59% from Hershey, again, it's up, but not out 
of the long-term realm of where we've seen it, I think you have a couple of businesses that are decent, facing some issues right now. I come down on Hershey as well. Same reasons you said, the better dividend growth rate. I think the stock looks like a good price right now. They have some near-term headwinds. Hormel's not a turnaround, but there are things that it needs to fix. I would want to see some signs that those things were fixed before I'd be willing to, uh, to take on uh, Hormel because you get a better yield, maybe a much worse performing stock. With Hershey, I think you're going to get a better performing stock over the long term, plus a dividend that's going to grow.